Voice. That's what I want to talk about today. Because I found something cool. And I want to share it with you. So let's see here. Uh, let's get the video flowing. There we go. Okay. So, Spice. And let me go full screen. So if you ever d sort of looked into analog design or how we do how we do circuit design, then you probably have encountered the name Spice. But you might not know what it is. So it's it's really a numerical mathematics engine. And there's a certain rules for how you write the resistors, capacitors, inductors, transistors, and the circuit components into a parsable format that the spice thing can read and then turn it into a basically a big matrix of equations that describes the um, conductances between every single node. Now this is a numerical solver. It uh, usually uses some sort of um, numerical integration methods and trying to figure out what is the conductance at any given point in time. But I'm not going to go deep into the actual inner workings of SPICE because I don't actually know them. I've never written a SPICE program, but I've used a SPICE program for the last, oh, 25 years, I guess. It was started way before that in 1973 by a guy called Nagel and uh, Peterson, and it's still used today. If we look at today, there is Cadence Spectre, there is Siemens Eldo, and there is Synopsis H Spice, and there's a bunch of others, commercial ones. You got some free ones, you got LT Spice, you got AIM Spice. It was actually written by a professor at NTNU. And then we have NG Spice, which in my opinion is the one you should choose if you want something that is open source. Now, all of these programs have pretty much exactly the same usage model. You call the SPICE program and you give it a test bench. That test bench is written in, well, the same language, the SPICE language, that it was that was defined a long, long time ago. And even, well, it doesn't really matter whether you're using the um, free ones like AIMSPICE or NGSPICE, or indeed the very expensive commercial ones like Spectre, that, well, it's a bit smaller on the screen here, but it's exactly the same usage model. They will actually also usually understand the same type of spice format. Sometimes though, there are flavors um, that is, well, call it dialects of spice that is not understood between the different ones. So the reason we use these mathematical engines is that any analog circuit that we want to predict how it's going to work when we get it back from the foundry, we have to use the mathematical models. It's not possible anymore to use hand calculations. The physics of the transistors is simply too complicated. Wow, I got sun today. Uh, it's just too complicated. We have to use these mathematical models and we have to simulate. Not only that, we know that we, when we make a transistor or a resistor or a capacitor or diode or bipolar or whatever on a chip, they will vary. You will never be able to make the same transistor twice. There will be slight modifications because they're so small. And there'll be changes as you make a transistor in the middle of the wafer and at the edges of the wafer. So that also means that we have to simulate over what we usually call corners. So some transistors will be slow, some will be fast, some will be fast PMOS, slow NMOS, and then vice versa. And we have to check over all those corners. Same for resistors. We have, resistors can be expected to vary maybe plus minus 10 to 20%, and same for capacitors. So we have to check that if we put a resistor in, 
the circuit still worked when you have plus minus 20%. Now you may ask how in, well, I'll try not to swear too much, but <laughs> how can you actually design something when you have plus minus 20% variation? Well, the trick with both transistors and resistors and capacitors is although you won't be able to make exactly the same size every time, for example, one kilo ohm, you can be pretty sure that if you put two, two resistors right next to, next to each other, they're going to be equal. The actual size might be 800k or it might be 1.2k, but both of them will be 1.2k. So the relative accuracy between resistors and capacitors, and to some extent transistors, can be pretty good. Resistors and capacitors can usually be down to 0.1%, maybe um, equal. <laughs> so that's how we make accurate analog circuits. We build it on relationships between resistors and capacitors. When it comes to diodes, we use usually, well, diodes. Mm. In most analog technologies, or digital technologies for that matter, where we don't really have the analog fancy stuff, we, well, diodes will always be there. Except if you're in uh, a fully depleted silicon on insulator, then you don't have the normal diodes anymore. But it turns out we usually need diodes, and also we usually need bipolars, because we still, in order to generate a constant voltage on the chip, we need a band gap, and that uses bipolars. In addition, we check over temperature, we check over voltage, we try to ensure that whatever we do to our circuit, it still works. And this means that we have to run quite a lot of spy simulations. There are tools, of course, what you're seeing on the right side here is the cockpit that is in Cadence Virtuoso uh, Assembler. And that's sort of usually the cockpit that is used in, well, if you're using Cadence tools. And to be honest, most professional designers, companies use Cadence because, well, it's the dominant one. If you're using one of the others, it's probably because your company doesn't want to pay for Cadence. <laughs> well, to be honest, these days, I'm I'm quite partial to the open source. I, I like the fact that I, I not only can I modify the SPICE program myself, I can understand the inner workings, but also I don't have to pay anybody. That that is cool. I don't like paying companies for, well, I don't, I'm fine with paying companies for a service or a program, but I don't like paying exuberant amount of, amounts of money for programs that are not that good. Anyway, when it comes to how we set up our simulations, one of the, one of the two things that we have to do in the test bench is specify the conditions for our circuits. We usually have to set the voltage that it's going to operate on, and we usually have to define ground, and that's what you're seeing here. We have a ground node, we have a VDD. One of the cool things about these voltage sources is that they're sort of a mathematical construct. They will force the voltage in a node to be in this case, 1.5 volts in reference to the zero node, which is the global ground kind of, no matter how much p current you want to pull from that voltage uh, source. Now that doesn't exist in the real world. There is nothing like an ideal voltage source. It simply does not exist. But in SPICE, it's okay. More dangerously, you have the independent cur current sources, and they force a current. So if I say that there's going to be a IP, well, we can choose a number, let's say 10 amps, which is a ginormous current in the uh, circuit context between the node VDP and ground, then it's going to be 10 amps. Doesn't matter <laughs> what type of transistors you put in or whatever you put into the circuits, if you have, for example, just a floating gate that you're forcing this current into. It doesn't matter because that current, current is going to be forced anyway. So... Independent current sources, treat with caution. Resistors, well, there's a resistor between node 1 and node 2, and it's 10k. You can use the uh, spice notation. Be a bit careful with the meg, because if you only, only write m, then sometimes you get milli, because spice is a case-insensitive language. Giga and tera and so on. Same for capacitors, ato, femto can be used. Okay, transistors. Now that's interesting, because... You can actually use the square law model. 
or the type of simple book models that you'll find for uh, transistors. But in general, if you're actually going to simulate with a technology, you need to use the transistor models from that technology because <laughs> a transistor is a quantum mechanical device. It depends so that the operation and the currents and all the specifics of the transistors actually depend on the exact physics of that particular technology. So that means that if I take my circuit from TSMC, 180 nanometer bulk CMOS to, I don't know, yeah, global foundries, 180 nanometer bulk CMOS, and I use the exact same sizes in the two technologies, the currents are going to be different. Because how Global makes their transistors is different from how TSMCs make their transistors. That's just how it is. It's a different stack up, a different doping, whatever it is, there is a difference. That means that these transistor models are horribly complicated. What you're seeing now on the screen on your right side is 200, the 284 parameters that is in the BSIM 4.5 model. Now, some students have asked me, why can't they just use the simple square law model? Do Why do you have to have all these parameters? It's just co so complicated. And my response to that is, actually it's not. <laughs> it's not so complicated. In my opinion, the BSIM 4.5 model is probably using exactly enough parameters in order to describe the physical behavior of the transistor. It's just that transistors happen to be complicated. So <laughs> if you're going to describe something that is complicated, had a lot, have lots of effects, like, I don't know, um, maybe it's the uh, gate-induced drain leakage or the drain induced barrier lowering or it's the the conduct what's it called channel length modulation or it's the velocity saturation or it's the quantum tunneling effects that can happen through the gate oxide or whatever type of physical phenomena happens it is in the parameters sometimes one of the missing things in bsim 4.5 is a noise type called um, generation recombination noise or random telegraph noise or burst noise or telegraph noise that's actually uh, something that w was not in the bsim 4.5 i don't know if it's added in the latest model but these days we've actually switched to different type of models quite often for the more advanced technologies so if you feel frustrated because the spice models are in port <laughs> are complex it's not a human's fault. It is simply physics and the transistor is complicated. Okay, to define a transistor once we have this model, we can just instantiate it. It'll be drain, gate, source, bulk, and the same for the PMOS, and we can put in the width and the length. Sometimes here it actually differs between which process design kit, which foundry, whether you need the, the micron or not. That's just the definition. It's quite important definition though. What I would recommend is if you want to get started with transistors and simulate those today, use the Skywater PDK. It's fully open source. So if I go here, let's try to make it bigger. So you can download the full PDK and I guess we should be able to find simulation. Well, there. Uh, yeah, somewhere in here, how to do. <laughs> that's quite a lot that's not done. But um, you'll find some description of the spice models in there. So that's a place to start. And one of the things I often get asked from my students is, how do we pick our sizes? Because you know the square law model. That's sort of the strong inversion model. And you know the weak inversion model. And based on the, those, uh, the students ask me sort of, uh, well, what's the mu and C ox? Can't I just put that into my equations and then calculate how much current and how big my uh, transistor should be? And in principle, you can. You can actually, let me go back. In this big list, there will be something called a U0, which is the mobility. And there will not be a C ox, but there will be a T ox. So a effective oxide thickness 
And from that, you can just, well, I guess it's, what is it? Epsilon, sil uh, silicon times epsilon vacuum divided by T ox is equal to the capacitance of the oxide, something like that. Yeah, I think that's the right way around. So you could actually extract those and you can put it into the equations. And if you do that, you're gonna get wrong current because it's complicated. So these equations that we, we teach you, like the um, in weak inversion, the current is proportional, exponentially proportional. Well, not proportional. It's proportional to the exponential of V effect divided by uh, the uh, some sort of factor, N times um, the thermal voltage. And in strong inversion, it's a square law type of thing. These are meant to describe the behavior. They're not meant for hand calculation, really. So what you have to do when you have a new technology like Skywater is you put in a transistor. It could be a diode connected transistor like this. It's a good way to start. And then you push a current into it. I don't know, one microamp, 10 microamp, whatever you want. And then you characterize it. What's the VGS? What's the gate such voltage? Uh, if you can, maybe extract the V effective. Extract the threshold voltage, and then vary current and see how it's behaving. Usually, when it comes to tra choosing transistor sizes, I sort of kind of like just picking some unit sizes. Uh, the width might be, I don't know, 4, 6, 10, whatever. It shouldn't be too wide, and it shouldn't be too short. You kind of want two contacts on the um, transistor. And for that to happen, you need to be a certain width. In Skywater, you actually need to be closer to 900 nanometers in order to have two contacts. And then if you need larger transistors, you would just put a bunch of transistors in parallel. You can also put transistors in series to make them kind of longer. One sort of good rule is that if you're making transistors in the def pair, then make them about maybe 1.2 times the uh, minimum length. You kind of want to stay away from the minimum length uh, quite often in these technologies. Then the uh, process engineers will use something called halo doping, which is injecting extra doping close to the drain and source to prevent uh, what's called punch through, or that the energy barrier of the, well, I guess the energy barrier between drain and source uh, to prevent that from being lowered so much that you actually can get electrons, electron injection straight across the uh, from source to drain, you put in extra doping close to the drain source. However, that changes the threshold voltage because as you may remember, <laughs> the threshold voltage is simply defined as at what gate voltage do you have to put an NMOS? So how, how, how high uh, do you have to put the VGS of the NMOS in order for the electron density in the channel to be equal, being equal to the hole density sort of in the bulk material. So if I increase the hole concentration in the bulk, then I will also increase the threshold voltage because I have to pull harder in order to get the same electron density. Where was I going with this? Yes, so you, you make them slightly longer, so have slightly less impact of the halo doping. Now, depending on the technology, you might actually see that as you increase the length, the threshold voltage goes down in some technologies that use halo doping, or you might actually see that it goes up in some technologies, which is a slightly different effect. For current mirrors, well, here it depends on how small is the technology. Is it, are you going all the way down to FinFET? Well, maybe you don't have much of a choice. You can't make the transistors longer. You can stack them. You can put multiple on top of each other to make them longer or in series, but you can't really necessarily make them longer. Now in good old 130 nanometer Skywater, it's totally fine to make the transistors longer. And I would say for current mirrors, you kind of want to go four times the minimum and maybe even above that if you want to. <clears throat> a good tip is actually to have a look at the GDS that the foundry used to extract the SPICE model because those transistors will be probably the best match to uh, the SPICE models that you're using and that's actually what you're looking for. You kind of want to 
You want to make sure that when you simulate in SPICE, you get actually the performance that you want on the chip. And if you use the exact same sizes that the foundry used, well, you increase the probability that it actually is the right mo SPICE model. One of the strategies that I know a few designers like is to use GMID, including myself. That's sort of my go-to kind of thing, because we know that in weak inversion, the transconductance divided by the drain current is roughly given by one over n times the uh, thermal voltage. Now, this turns out to be around 25, because n is usually at like 1.5. Um, at um, room temperature, the thermal voltage is about 26 millivolts. And then, well, this total factor turns out to be around 25-ish. As we increase the inversion, so that that is actually increasing the electron density in the channel, then we go into what's called strong inversion, and here we get a GMR ID that's more like two times the two divided by the V effective. So if the V effective is a few hundred millivolts, we're around a let's see. 2 divided by 0 0.2. I'm terrible at health calculations. Uh, is that 10? <laughs> it sounds like 10. Yeah, it's 10. Yeah, so around 10. That's a sort of uh, maybe a good place to be. So actually, when I characterize my technology, well, characterize my transistors, what I do is I just put a bunch of sizes down that I like. Let me show you how the transistor looks. This is one example, right? So, so this is a typical minimum transistor. It has two uh, poly gates because I like two. That means I don't have to worry about the current direction because I always always have drain in the middle and then it sources at the end. So the current goes in both directions and I don't have to worry about which way I flip the transistor. I have poly gates spaced exactly the same pitch, so I can stack these and get a uniform pitch, which helps with litho if you choose the right size for that technology. Uh, for the minimum ones, and then if I want larger ones, I just increase the gate length, which is pretty much what I've done here. So width in this case is this uh, X distance, and uh, the gate length is the Y distance. Now, I maybe have a slightly different, well, slightly funny or strange convention when it comes to how I name them, uh, it's roughly, okay, two contacts, that's the width, and then two times the minimum size. So for example, if I look at that transistor, then I've actually done a current sweep, and I've looked at, okay, if I want a GMR ID of 10, what current do I have to put into the device? And what VGS do I get? So around 800 millivolts, and here I also done it at corners, so I can see from 700 to 900 then. If I try kind of to memorize these things, it becomes easier to stack up the transistors and roughly pick the say, right sizes and so on. And then of course you have PMOS and NMOS, and well, then I don't have to worry about too much how, how I'm choosing my transistors. I, I, I like to say that Choosing your transistor sizes is like painting with a very wide brush. It's not like painting an old painting. It's like painting a house. You choose a wide brush and you use that to get the job done. <laughs> Sometimes you have to use a fine brush, but that's when you care about one transistor. Maybe it's in the LNA of a radio or whatever. Okay. Moving on. So... Now you can go away and you can look at the Spice manual and you can install the tools. So I've made a video on that. You'll find it on Analogicus. I'll put the link, the, the link to the slides in the description below. And you can get going. And then you can do analog design. You can, well, this is sort of a quick recipe on how to do it. Define a problem. What are you actually trying to do? Then find a circuit that fits. And here you look at RTB Explorer, you look at books, pick the right sizes, use your knowledge about weak inversion, strong inversion, and all those different operating conditions. But then you go away in your space, uh, space, <laughs> space, spice simulator, spice, and check is the operating region correct? Here it's really useful to use X game built-in sort of uh, back annotation of spice parameters. There's another video uh, of mine that you can have a look on how to do that. And then you can check sort of AC 
uh, analysis, you can check DC analysis, transient analysis, figure out that the circuit works, check every single knob you can turn on your circuit, make sure that everything works, because usually it is not the difficult parts that you worry about that fail. It's the simple inverter that should have been, or the simple AND that should have been that NAND and that type of thing that fails. And of course, we check all the corners, blah, blah, blah. Read the list. But now you might be wondering, if you're totally new to the game, how do you get started? Because many of you don't necessarily yet have the skills to install the tools. It is a big, big step. So if you're completely sort of new to Linux or Tools or Spice or all these kind of things, the step up to actually being able to install might seem insurmountable. I was talking to one of my students last week, actually Friday, today is Sunday, and I had an idea. Maybe I could make it simple for you guys. So what I did was I made a Git repo. Hopefully you have a Git account. Okay, so let's make this bigger, something like that. So this is my, I'll put it in the description below. This is a Git repository. Now this is a bit special Git repository. It doesn't have that much uh, in terms of files. It has a readme that is described what it is and how to use it. One of the special things is I'm using something called GitHub Pages and GitHub Actions. So when, let me jump to this page, this is just the Actions button. So, oh, maybe I should show how we get there. So let's go to the main page. And if I now press this Actions button, here we have a workflow which will run every time I can commit a new version. And if I, I just click on the ones that is there right now, then it says deploy. Now you don't need to worry about the details here. I've set it all up for you. <laughs> so if I go and open that link, I get to a page that looks like this. And this is actually generated every time you commit something and you can see a simulation result. Okay, now that's maybe not that fancy in itself. It's a simple web page with some simulation results. But let me show you something. So right now, this is a common source amplifier. Let's have a look at the spice file. We go into sim and we go into CS and there's a bunch of files here, but let's focus on the spice file. Let's start there. Okay, so here I have an option. This is just telling Spice, ng-spice what parameters to use. I have a parameter that comes from one of the other files. Don't worry about it. It's uh, the VDD, it's 1.8 volts. And then I have two independent sources defining my ground and my 1.8 volt VDD, which I ramp up uh, within sort of 10 nanoseconds. And then I have a sinusoidal source. Okay, let's take the common source amplifier first. This sinusoidal VIN goes through a one picofarad capacitor to a node called VG, and that VG is connected to the gate of a transistor, where the drain is connected to a resistor of 1K that goes to VDD. So think kind of like a resistor here, transistor here a common source amplifier, one of the first amplifiers you learn about. Hopefully you've seen one of those. Now, something I do in this amplifier is that I have to make sure that the gate voltage is cor correct <laughs> for this transistor. And the way I do that is I have another uh, resistor somewhere else between a VDD and a VBIOS of 10K. And then I have a diode connector transistor with the, the bulk and source connected to ground. This is a NFET, and here we can see that I'm using the Skywater PDK 
of a length of 0.2 micron times 1 micron. And I'm using exactly the same size. Let's make it even bigger. I'm using exactly the same size for the common source amplifier. I'm just using 10 of those. And since I have 1K here, and I'm using 10 of the transistors, then I should have a resistance of 1K to get everything matched. Now, from the V-bias node to the gate node, I'm re just using a high ohmic resistor. This is... Ah, is this 10 meg or 10 milli? I think this maybe should have been meg. It might be correct. But let's make sure that... Well, now I went to the edit, edit mode, by the way. Let's make sure that this is meg. And where, while we're at it, uh, if we're looking at this uh, plot, what we're seeing is the VG. So that's like uh, 0.07 to 0.05, and uh, the V out, which is higher. And we can see the frequency is pretty high. So let's actually reduce the frequency to one gig. Okay, so all I've done now is use my browser I have edited a text file online. You can do this on your phone. And when I press commit changes, let's say, let's be uh, kind and add a nice message, change to meg and one gigahertz. Commit that. Okay. Right. If I now go to actions, we can actually see something has started. It has started running something in the background on GitHub Actions. What it's actually doing here now is downloading one of my images from like a virtual um, Linux machine from Docker, um, what's it called? Docker.com, the hub. Docker hub, that's the word. And it's pulling that down. And after a while now, it will start it. And then it's installing a few tools. I use something called SixSim, which is a sort of orchestration tool, similar to the assembler I showed you, just for ter terminal. And it's installing that, and then it's um, installing Pandoc, and then blah, 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 blah. Somewhere down here, it's running a command called make test in this uh, test bench folder. And here I'm running the test bench. So, mm, 6sim is really kind of like a wrapper tool for ng-spice. The tran, that's referring to the tran.spy that we just edited. And the stuff after here is the actual corner. So I'm running typical transistor corner, I'm running typical temperature, I'm running typical um, voltage. Okay, then spice is running, blah, 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 running, running, running. It's extracting some stuff. Uh, it's extracting some values, and then it's saving a image and doing more stuff. Don't worry about that more stuff. You can always figure that out later on. But in the end, it deploys to my GitHub pages. So if I go to this readme now, and I press the refresh button, do you see that? It's changed. See that? Now, a couple of things happened. <laughs> First of all, I made it not work anymore. <laughs> See that? It doesn't work. Okay. Fine. Maybe 10 meg was a bit big. Let's fix that. Uh, let me go back to the code. Uh, sim. And CS. And print by, let me change it to one. Oh, I'm not in editor mode. I just click this button. Now I'm in editor mode. And let's see, where's the transistor? There, there it was. So I had 10 milli, that's probably too low. Let's put 1K then, see if that works. Okay. Now, <laughs> the bad thing about this is, well, how did it long to run? Uh, let's see, we can see the runtime here. It takes about one minute. Okay, so 
I can change the spy file and it'll run, but it takes a minute. Now, if you actually install all the tools locally, of course, then it doesn't take a minute. You can do this in uh, no time. But actually, while it's running now, I'll just pause <laughs> and we'll come back shortly. Okay, we're back. And now I've updated uh, the, well, I clicked the refresh button and now we can see we have our input signal again and we have our output signal. And now it seems to work. It's back to where it should be, about 10 dB gain. Right, okay. But this is my repository. You're not me. So how do you copy my repository and do this yourself without having to install the tools or worrying about Linux? And that's what I wanted to show you today. So you go to the link here and then you push the button that is called fork, create a new fork. And in order to do this, you need a GitHub account. So just, you have to make that first. You'll figure that out, don't worry. So you go to my repository, you make a fork, call it the same thing, copy the main branch only and create fork. Okay, so what happens now is it takes a copy of that repository. And now you have a repository where you can do whatever you want. So the difference will be, you'll have your username here and it'll be called the same thing. There's a couple of things that you need to set up. Okay, so in order to make this work, we have to go to settings. We have to scroll down and we have to get to pages and where it says build and deployment, you have to select GitHub actions like that. Okay, and let's go back to the repository and then you should be able to click here Use your GitHub web pages website, save changes. And now I should be able to go to actions and it should say, okay, you forked the repository. You copied my repository to your GitHub account. And now I want to enable the actions. So if you're paranoid, please go and read what the action does. Um, I'll show you where the action file is. So inside this GitHub workflows, you'll have a YAML file, and here you can see exactly what is done when this action is run. So it downloads an image from uh, Docker Hub. It, uh, let's see, checks out the repositories. It clones a technology library, and it installs CIC sim, it installs Pandoc, and then it sets the default spice options in the spice init file. If, you, if you're not following what, what's happening now, don't worry, you don't need to understand this. But for those that do, it might be useful. And then a couple of other commands in order to set up the path, uh, the PDK route, this is one, yeah. And then this is a trick I use. Uh, I'm generating a random plot name for every time I generate the PNG files, the image that you saw, in order to, to, to make sure the caches actually, um, to fool the caches. And then it runs all the simulations. Okay, but don't worry about that. If you didn't understand it, that's fine. What you need to do is go to actions and then you enable your actions. Okay, and then we can go here. And before we run, let's, so now this is my repository, right? It's not the Analogicus one. So if I go here and if you do the same thing, <laughs> then you can go here and you can go to the spice file and let's say that instead of having 1k, uh, let's try with, let's see if it, uh, no, we, sh we should have a visible change. Yeah, let's change it to five gigahertz, okay? And now I commit changes. Change to five gig. Now, while that's running, let me make a point. What I've set up here is a single spice file and in your repository, you can do whatever you want. You can copy it, you can make it another one, you can put it in your own circuit, you can do whatever you want, you can explore. Just to illustrate how this works though, um, this, if you want to understand it, 
is that the first thing that happens, actually, let's go in the make file because that's actually shows you what happens. So here we have a command to run that typical test bench, uh, that transient test bench. So it runs CIC sim. Now, CIC sim is, as I said, an orchestration tool. What that done does is basically runs ng spice for the correct corner for this transient spice file. Now, after it runs ngSpice, it will run ngSpice again, but with the tran.mess file. So this is also a normal spice file, but what this mess file does is it actually extracts the peak-to-peak -peak values for the input voltage, the gate voltage, and the VR voltage. Once that's done, then 6sim will run the tran.py, and in the tran.py, I actually calculate the uh, gain from the input to the gate node. So that's sort of uh, V in to VG. And then I calculate the gain on the amplifier from the gain node to the output. So the VPP at the output, the peak to peak voltage at the output, divided by the peak to peak voltage at the gain. And then I turn it into dB because dB is better. <laughs> Uh, the next string here, uh, that's just to generate a random string. If this CIC random plot name is set, that just makes sure that the, the caches in the browsers, they update. And then I plot the VG, and I plot the Vout. Actually, yeah, let's actually see if it's uh, done running. So let's go to the actions. Change to five gig, that's deployed. Okay, and I can just click this link. So now it'll open the same kind of page as you saw before. Uh, let's go into the CS README, but the frequency is higher. Now, notice that here, well, it's maybe not easy to see, but what, what I have at the top here is a different URL, URL than this one. I can refresh this page and it doesn't change because this is a different repository. <laughs> and um, that means you can play around, you can do whatever, you can damage it. And if you damage it, just roll it back. It's version controlled. Perfect. To demonstrate, let's edit this Python file and let's add, what did I call it? The VN, the input signal. So we can see that too. Why not? Uh, let's commit changes. Add that input signal. Okay. And now that's building, it's running. Okay, it takes another minute. Yes, it's slow. Maybe it's possible to make it faster by using a smaller docker image and so on. But what I wanted to do is to make it as simple as I could for you guys to get started. Once you have started, though, I would strongly recommend that you actually install the tools locally. So if you go to my webpage, that is in the link in the slide set, you will find how to install them. Once you have them installed, then if I go here, and let's uh, copy that page, and... Let's go back to the beginning. I have put at the end of this uh, this HTML file how to run it locally. So if I if I clone these two repositories, this is mine though. So you, you should probably change it with yours. So let's actually let me do that. So if I take my <laughs> this repository, uh, should we make it bigger? Yeah, why not? Let's make it bigger if we can. Okay. So, I have forked, I'm changing it to my username, and then we're cloning. Okay, that's done. And I need the technology files. Cloning that. Goody. And you need to do this uh, 6sim install. I already have that, so I'm skipping that. And then I want to go into the CS directory, and... Now I can run make test. And since it's now running locally, it'll run faster. And it should run in a few seconds, I hope. Um, so now it's running in the simulation. Let's see. 
counting seconds. Okay, maybe it's a bit more than a few seconds. <laughs> maybe it's like 20. So struggling actually a bit with the operating points. That's interesting. Okay, now it's done. And now it's generating the output files, blah, blah, blah. But since I'm locally now, I don't need to look at that HTML file. I could if I want to. It actually is here. It is there. If you wanted to look at that. But since I'm running locally, I can actually look at the output with 6M. Okay. So let's see. That's the output signal. Uh, that's VG, and where's VN? Okay, so that's what we should see now online, right? VN is actually around zero, but the other ones are up there. So let's go online and see if it's built. Uh, this is my original. This is mine. Let's go to the simulations. And let's reload. Hey, hey look, we got the same plot. Yeah. So that means you can you can get started, right? You can get started understanding Spice using the online repositories. Once you feel comfortable and have actually been able to install the tools and the PDK and all the uh, belts and whistles, then you can run it locally. It's faster. But yeah, hopefully you'll find this useful. If not, well, hopefully you, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. Have a fantastic day.